Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. We are here with a very special person. Helen Gim recently announced her candidacy for mayor of Philadelphia. Ms. Gim makes it clear that she knows that Philadelphia needs a proven fighter who isn't afraid to take on our hardest challenges and deliver on solutions that have been a model for the nation. She says that she is that person. Ms. Gim is fighting for a safer, more prosperous, equitable Philadelphia that works for all. Ms. Gim has been endorsed by First War Democrats, Unite Here, and many others, including Philadelphia Federation of Teachers, American Federation of Teachers, Working Families Party, AFSCME, DC 47, Unite Here, Locals 274, 634, and 54, Teamsters, BMWED, and so many others. Welcome to the program, Helen. Thank you, Roberto. It's such an honor to be with you again. I've always enjoyed every time we've been together and um, just excited to talk to you about how Philadelphia can lead the nation. Well, let me tell you something, and I want to start the interview uh, this way, because I remember, I think it was uh, Netroots, Arizona. Maybe I'm wrong, but one of the Netroots and Nina Turner, uh, one of the most prolific speakers there there's out there came on and she gave her stump speech as she was running for i think it was senator in 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 um ohio and then i saw this woman coming up and she was you know uh, sh she seemed a bit quiet etc and i said oh my god why did they have her follow nina turner why could they do that and then you started to speak and you grabbed that audience and you know, knew exactly what to say because you believed everything that you were saying. And you captured the entire net roots at that point. Tell us a little bit about who Helen Gim is. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I still would not want to follow Nina Turner, but um, but I, you know, I uh, I, I am a Philly mom. You know, I am a former public school teacher, a longtime community organizer. And a lot of my work in 20 years of community organizing happened before I ever ran for elected office. And because, you know, many of us don't bring political titles or power to the table, we find ways to get to the table in other ways. We built huge coalitions based on really important issues that were mobilizing through the city. Um, that included uh, helping stop a city from spending a billion dollars um, for a publicly funded baseball stadium that would have displaced a large portion of a of a neighborhood in Philadelphia. That meant fighting for our public schools when they were threatened to being taken over by a for-profit company um, when my oldest daughter was just about to enter kindergarten. Um, those things shaped me and made me realize that when so many people in political power looked at really difficult situations, but about essential issues that mattered to people's lives, they often didn't have any of the answers. But when you went out in, into communities, when you talk to residents who are about to be displaced, renters find to, fighting to hang on to their homes, um, disabled members of our community struggling to get access to accessible housing, or young people and parents trying to go to a decent school for which they could get their education. I found that there were always answers. There was always clarity. There was always only the prioritization of people's lives over the politics of a given moment that told us no each and every time. So, you know, I spent my life building movements proving that ordinary people with the with the vision and the um, power and and you know, like mobilization that is literally built out of just saving lives, um, we're able to take on the politics of any given moment. And that's how, you know, when I ultimately ran for office, um, I, you know, we helped end that state takeover of our public schools from 17 years ago, um, put nurses and counselors back into every school. I fought to get clean water in every school building, and now I'm on a mission to modernize every single public school inside and out so they can be that promise to every child when they enter that this city has their back. You know, we made sure that housing was primary, that we're going to do development without displacement, but that means that we have to centralize um, housing. 
So we made sure that, you know, when we heard that there were so many people being evicted, we delivered a huge um, eviction prevention program led by renters themselves um, who said they needed a lawyer in court, who said that they needed a chance to negotiate um, other alternatives to an eviction. And, you know, we ended up uh, creating an eviction prevention program that slashed evictions in our city by two thirds, um, made sure that 50,000 people were housed in the city of Philadelphia in the middle of the pandemic, um, distributed almost $250 million to small landlords and large landlords, and probably the single biggest rescue effort of an industry. And now the program that we created right here in Philadelphia is replicated all across the country and was just included in the uh, White House's National Renter Bill of Rights. What it proves is that when people lead on solutions that actually fix problems in our lives, we don't just fix things within Philadelphia. We become a model for the nation. You know what is interesting is that, and I, I love the way that you started talking about being a community organizer, because if you want, I believe if you want to be an effective politician, you didn't start out as a politician. My God, you are a teacher. So you saw kids at their at their the genesis of the education. You saw kids that had problems and kids that did well. You could see why some did well, why some didn't. You were there on the, in the field as a community organizer. To tell you the truth, I think most politicians or all politicians should first start touching people. And I think that's what you've done over the decades that uh, that you've actually been a community organizer. Tell us a little bit about why you believe you are that person qualified as one who knows the community, that one who actually not spoke about community from an ivory tower, but has been a part of that community. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I come out of a world where political titles and power are not what brings us to the table. And so what we, you know, what I think community organizers do better than anybody else is that we help mobilize huge coalitions that make it so that elected officials, career electeds who always told us no, wealthy bureaucrats or CEOs, um, that they can't look away anymore. Um, I'll never forget being a teacher in a public school um, in Philadelphia. You know, I taught in 90 degree classrooms in a 100 plus year old building. Um, I remember losing children out of my classroom. Um, you know, they would come in and come out on any given day. And, you know, I'd ask around and say, you know, what happened um, to, to one of the, you know, one of my 10 year olds. And the thing was, was that I never got a call from our principal or anybody from, uh, you know, government telling us what had happened. I usually heard about it from another 10 year old in the class who was a neighbor that they got evicted um, and uh, they weren't going to come to school anymore because they had lost the a roof over their heads. And I never, ever forgot that. And I made sure that, you know, when I got into office, if I had the chance to make change um, and, you know, to be clear, uh, I believe that every step of the way we have an opportunity to make change. But if I ever got into office, I would never I would be a different kind of leader that we would show that these things that were told to us happen time and time again, that this was just the way systems ran, um, that we would actually prove that these things could be fixed and we never, ever had to live like this. Um, I think that I learned that early on when I saw nurses taken out of public schools and children actually die in schools without school nurses. I learned that early on when I saw, you know, uh, as we do, a neighborhood literally five miles away from here, building a $140 million middle school, brand new middle school, public school for 12, 12 year olds. And our kids play on broken asphalt for, that that's, you know, like, you know, called a playground. Um, they go to schools without functioning bathrooms and roofs that are leaking. We have to see a massive shift in what we think is not just politically possible, what's but what's politically necessary right now. And it does take somebody from outside of government, oftentimes. Philadelphia is probably one of the last of the machine politics cities where most people come into politics being kind of groomed through a system 
that rewards people who often are in line with the traditional politics of any given moment. But the politics of any given moment are monstrous for the majority of people, especially in a city like Philadelphia, where poverty and violence and disinvestment and um, dysfunction, like, you know, pile upon one another. It's not just that we suffer from poverty. It's that we suffer from a government that further impoverishes people, further pulls people away from any amount of opportunity and refuses to be a Calvary. So, you know, my time in office, I, I came into office in 2016, less than two terms ago. But I wanted to show that as soon as we came in, we could prove that all the things that we talked about that these systems did not have to perpetuate and that we had a major role to play in ending evictions, in keeping people housed, in delivering on educational investments that can transform lives. And now we're on a mission to guarantee that a progressive movement can meet the safety demands of this city without rolling the clock back on civil rights, that we can excite economic opportunity without becoming beholden to massive corporations, exploiting cities um, for, you know, for tax breaks and other things without really seeing a rise in the economic well-being of the majority of our citizens. And that, you know, in this post-COVID time, that actually we are going to center the health and well-being of every single resident in our city. It's not enough for me to see homicide numbers go down. It's that I need to see life expectancy and life opportunity go up yes. for every single young person, for every single resident, and for every single person who calls Philadelphia home or believes it's a place where opportunity can exist for them. And 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 that is why uh, you were so impressive at Netroots, because you were speaking not only a wish list, but a how to fulfill this wish list. Now, uh, everybody talks about employment. Everybody talks about, well, X amount of folks of employment, of employment has gone down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But many people treat employees, hourly employees, as just cogs in a wheel, widgets that they can put here or there. Tell us a little bit about uh, the fair work week, where you tackle that particular issue as well, showing the humanity in work. Yes, absolutely. And now more than ever, it's so important. I mean, there's no surprise that Philadelphia, like most American cities, is built off of a lot of service work. And in Pennsylvania, we have the absolute lowest minimum wage of any surrounding state. We're at the bottom. We're at seven twenty-five an hour, two dollars and eighty-three, uh, two dollars and eighty-three cents an hour if you're a tipped worker. Welcome Those to Texas. Wages, yeah. Those wages are poverty wages, and we all know that. And, you know, you see a lot of companies cycle in and out. Um, you have high turnover in the retail, restaurant, hospitality industries where many of these uh, service jobs are concentrated. They are hourly. They often do not ever make full-time work. Um, they don't often come with benefits. And the one thing that we noticed over and over and over again was that they had chaotic schedules. 70% of people before our Fair Work Week law kicked in, almost 70% of hourly workers did not know what their day-to-day -day schedule was. It could change on any given moment, and it could even change hour to hour. Um, you could get called into work and then sent right back home with no compensation for the shifts that were promised to you. Um, you could see uh, you could see people being called in for overtime. Um, for hours on end, even though they may have other commitments, including other jobs, um, care for an elderly or uh, a child, uh, an elderly in, uh, individual or a child, um, whether they were juggling, you know, school or other types of obligations. When we see um, unstable schedules, what we were realizing were that employers were controlling people's time when they weren't at work, not when they were at work, but when they were not. And that we felt was something that as a municipality, we could control. Now, to be clear, Elizabeth Warren has had a fair scheduling uh, plan in Congress year after year for many years, and we saw that, um, and it simply was not moving through Congress. But in a 
in a city like ours, we have the power to enact a fair work week schedule at the local level. And so we led with the voices of workers. Initially, people are like, this isn't, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, others were saying, this is an HR issue, you should stay out of it. Nobody wants to get into people's schedules. But once we led with the voices of workers, once we proved that, you know, did a study that showed, you know, that people, the vast majority of people did not even know what their work schedules were, everything changed. Everything changed when you had a college student saying, I'm trying to work a job and pay to go to college, but I can't make I can't meet both when my classes uh, or when my job um, calls me in on hours when I'm supposed to be in class or when I get shifts canceled and I can't pay my college tuition bill. We heard from moms who said that their daycare schedules relied on jobs that were deeply unstable and where they couldn't even predict the hours that they worked. So our Fair Work Week schedule was a huge win in 2018. Um, we pulled a lot of employers along with us. Um, we tried to say that this is normalized in other cities like Seattle and New York um, and uh, and made sure that um, 130,000 plus hourly workers would have the promise at some of our nation's biggest retailers, Target, Walmart, McDonald's, elsewhere, would have a promise and a commitment that they would have uh, advance notice, two weeks advance notice of their schedule, pay if shifts got canceled, a chance to earn additional hours. And, you know, slowly and surely what we are trying to do at the local level is prove that this poverty is not just about hourly wages, you know, moving Philadelphia from $7.25 an hour to $8 an hour, which is going to be a big boon and will be important. But it needs to be combined with many other things in order for it to be transformative. Poverty one of the things we learn about poverty is poverty is all about time. People who live in poverty lose time more than anything else. And the fair work week schedule was a promise that time would be as valuable and seen as valuable as the amount of dollars that were being done. So we're going to fight on both fronts. Um, but I'm really proud that after we were able to move our fair work week, um, Chicago advanced, other cities advanced. And this is how we can see actually gains across the country. The biggest cities in the country should lead. That is great. That is the difference between seeing society as society working for business as opposed to there being a business surrounded by what makes society better. It's so hard to get that across. So many politicians are there just to say, we'll arrange the cogs to serve business. There's another thing that you are uh, very involved with, and that is that has to do with mental health. Many don't see that the crime rate Problems at home, problems at school, many of these things uh, all form one, one unit uh, that comes together to work against many. Now you, you, you've brought yourself into the mental health, not debate, but action. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's no question that um, the violence that is prevalent all across the country and deeply concentrated here in Philadelphia um, has had a massive impact. And there are individuals who want to roll the clock back on civil rights, bring us back to dark days of unconstitutional practices that have put cities like mine under uh, you know, Department of Justice consent decrees or has contributed to mass incarceration and racial profiling that has harmed communities of color and especially in black and brown communities. Um, but, you know, in the in the conversation around how to tackle safety, what we hear over and over and over again from so many community members is the importance of mental health and outreach into communities. And that is a conversation that has traditionally not been had um, either within lots of communities or external to it. And so um, I have made it clear that I centered the mental health and well-being of everybody. And that includes from the earliest ages. Um, that's why I got nurses, counselors, and social workers Back into the schools. majority of our schools, that it had to be a priority. Um, but one of the bigger areas that we're, we're zeroed in on is um, in 2021, we helped pilot uh, the in, in concert with a host of advocates and mental health professionals, 
the first non-police mobile mental health crisis units. Um, this is meant to be a unit that would take away many of the 911 calls that often go into the police department. Um, they are self-identified as needing mental health responders. So it, the, the, the purpose was to send out a trained mental health respondent plus an EMT out to uh, homes that specifically requested it. And what it meant was that, you know, I feel like when people call 911 for help, they should know that the right kind of help is on the way. And if they're identifying a psychotic episode, an addiction situation, or de-escalation situation, then they need that and not somebody who is untrained in this field coming in, you know, usually with a lot of you know, aggression because right. you've got a uniform, you've got a weapon, um, you're call, you know, the, the point is for policing is to calm things down, but that often escalates a situation when you're dealing with mental health. Now, the difference here is, is that, um, you know, and, and we see it not only uh, in mental health experiences, but particularly around domestic violence. So domestic violence is another area where we've just seen escalating, escalating problems and very poor responses back from, you know, police officers and others, because this is, a, again, another area where we need to retrain people, respond to situations, domestic violence in the home overwhelmingly contributes to violence outside of the home as well. And so, you know, we want all eyes on, on our mental health responders. But that being said, one of the problems that we're dealing with is that Philadelphia um, unlike other cities, is constantly in a pilot mode. So we started in 2021 with just two units in a city of one and a half million people. Right. Um, that's clearly inadequate. It's just clearly inadequate. And uh, Denver, for example, started at the exact same time. They now take thousands and thousands of calls through their mobile mental health crisis unit. Um, they are professionalizing and expanding, and we are still at a pilot phase. So my job as mayor is to invest in this area, to prove that um, investments on, on not only training people to become better at the mental health work not only will draw more people into this field, um, but it will actually help us respond better and allow police officers to actually respond to the 911 calls that demand their expertise, their training and their presence. You know, it, it is amazing because in speaking to you today, I've heard you refer to other cities, other locales that have th that done things that are successful and things that you could also bring to your 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 community. And also the converse that your community has done this. Others uh, in, in others can take Philadelphia's lead on this particular issue to do that. That's what it takes to be a good leader. In other words, you have to look at things that work, whether in your city or otherwise. And it's, that is excellent. The other thing that I that I think people need to, to realize is one of the things that you attempted that you bring it into schools is a lot of the times when you have a middle school or a elementary school or a high school. The first thing that goes are uh, goes things like the arts and and music and other things that complement one's existence and makes one more uh, you know more stable, and you know to the guys who just count numbers they just throw those things out the door, and treat. Yeah, I don't. Go I don't ahead. even consider the arts to be um, complementary. I think they are ex essential to existence. There you I go. I think that when you do when you meet with a lot of young people. Um, especially in a city like Philadelphia. I think, you know, one of the things I talk about is that um, Philadelphia is a city that is often called the poorest large city in America because almost one out of four residents lives in poverty. But the more staggering figure is that 37% of our children are actually born into it. And if there is one thing that we know about poverty, it is fundamentally dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. From the moment of existence. It strips everything away from you as humanity. And oftentimes what I see is that schools replicate that type of inhumanity. It takes sort of the thing that has been denied to communities um, all across the city, um, not who are poor, but who have been impoverished. I'm very purposeful that poverty on this scale is not by accident. You cannot accidentally allow 37% of your kids to be born into poverty. That is no accident. Whether intentional or not, it is manufactured, it is it is by design, and thus everything that we do should be designed to reverse all of that. Um, and that, that is the kind of, of 
purposefulness, relentlessness, and um, determination that needs to go in to actually turn things around. But when I walk into a lot of schools um, and talk to young people, especially those who are in our, who end up in our juvenile justice or child welfare system, many of them are, are, you know, have felt rejected by a school system that just remediated them, just tried to make them fit into standardized boxes and never allowed them to become their fullest person. And so their interests right now, the things that make them excited are are about a, a reaffirmation of their own humanity. And that starts with arts. They are into graphic design. They are into fashion. They are into music. They are into writing and storytelling. They're into narratives, however they may be exercised across, you know, multiple different um, you know, art forms. And um, I think that this is something that is extremely powerful, that it is hopeful and that excites the imagination and could revitalize the ways in which we both reach people, but have people engage with us. I've often talked a lot about how I would, how I would like to see working artists embedded in a lot of our institutions, particularly in behavioral health, um, particularly around uh, making sure that, you know, parks and rec centers always have art programs that are associated with them. It's not just about sports and other kind of competitive right. work. It is actually about restoring people to people, a reminder that our humanity starts with our identification as humans, our expression as humanity, um, and that there are real economic benefits, there are academic benefits and other types of things um, that happen when we when we really actually invest in it. And, you know, just secondarily, like Philadelphia is a historic city. We're the sounds of Philadelphia. We're the home of uh, American bandstand to the roots. And, you know, like we are are very clear that um, that this kind of joy that emanates out from um, from communities all across Philadelphia that have defined the sounds of America um, can be, need to be revitalized again, and that this isn't just you know kind of a a pipe dream, but it's actually work. You know, it's economic work, it's investments in communities, uh, but I think it gives back uh, you know a hundredfold, um, if not more. It is important how. You made that you you, you made that uh, transition. It, how can you see the value of sports and not see the value of arts? It, it is uh, it, 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 the congruence is so amazing that you wonder how people just cannot see that. Um, good that that Philadelphia is going to have a mayor who thinks like that uh, <laughs> going going forward. Now, um, I always have a last question, and you know what that last question is, and that is. What would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? What would you like to tell the audience that they need to hear? Well, you know, many people are going to watch and say, why should I care about Philadelphia? You know, like, I don't live there. We don't see, you know, it's not going to touch me. Um, I'm worried about this and that. But one of the things that I try to tell a lot of people is that we have for too long focused a lot of our attention on, um, on places that have that are, you know, they can always evolve, but it takes time. You know, Congress right now, um, many people probably donated countless dollars and more importantly, like countless hours fretting about obscure places in Wisconsin, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, hoping to influence a Congress that is largely controlled by money, um, that has really become rigidified. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't continue to do that. But I want people to not... And, and those things are absolutely necessary. But I, I want people to see hope in local movements. You know, you talked a little earlier about what I see um, building from the ground up. And what I see is that people who are deeply close to movements are actually deeply tied to local politics. But as you noted, my local politics isn't just about Philadelphia's for Philadelphians only. My local politics is how we spread the good word um, out to lots of different communities that have the power to make change. And that, you know, if you're worried about the education um, that's happening in our country right now, um, it does, you know, it is as important to elect your school board as it is who is the U.S. Secretary of Education. That's, it is as important to have um, justice be defined by your district attorney and not whoever is the U.S. attorney general in the moment. And in our nation's largest cities, you are seeing the rise of a vibrant um, 
you know, highly mobilized, organized community of people um, who have been advocating and exhorting for change for a roof to keep over our heads um, under rising, you know, rising costs um, for people who have fought for decent schools in a stratifying uh, economy and world. You know, we are fighting to make sure that jobs are and people within those jobs are as valued as the corporate entities and the Wall Street, you know, executives making decisions about people's lives. We are proving, in fact, that there is nothing about us without us. And I think that this movement is transforming economies, but they're doing it at the ground level. So why should anyone watching your show care about what's happening in Philadelphia? It's because I hope over the next 81 days, you will see a real people's movement striving um, to take the helm of one of America's largest cities and prove that these cities, these original cities, you know, I often say Philadelphia's original city of rebels and revolutionaries, <laughs> that this city can write a new blueprint um, for an America that has been too far left behind. And that hope is as much local and in our municipalities, in the work that we do at the local level as it is anywhere in Congress. This isn't a hierarchy about politics and power. It is about our ability to mobilize change anywhere, everywhere um, that we can see it. And um, that's what we're doing in Philadelphia. I hope folks um, who are excited can go to our website, um, www.hellengen.com, um, and just be invested in this campaign, um, support uh, what's happening in Chicago, Philly, Philly's up next, and, um, and we're here to transform this country as much as we are to transform our city. Helen Gim, mayoral candidate for Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a hell of a community organizer, a former teacher, councilwoman in Philadelphia, and much more. Thank you so kindly for having Thank been you. on Politics Done Right. Philadelphia could do absolutely no better. Thank you so kindly. Thank you, Roberto. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.